We're going to continue in our verse-by-verse -verse study of the Gospel of Matthew this morning, and we have hit yet another milestone. We have completed our verse-by-verse -verse study of Matthew chapter 23, and so before we move over into chapter 24, we are going to Selah. We are going to stop. We are going to pause. We are going to reflect on what we have learned, what we have discovered in this chapter, and we're going to stop again to ask ourselves, what are we really doing here? What are we doing gathering in this place? What are we doing when we sit and listen to the Word of God go forth? So as we do that, I'm going to read the entire chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 23. So as I do that, you can sit back, relax, pay attention, reflect, remember the things that we have studied, the things that we have learned, and bear with me as I read for us in Matthew chapter 23, starting at verse 1. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you to do, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. You fools, you blind men, which is more important, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the altar on it, he is obligated. You blind men. Which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears both by the altar and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears both by the temple and by him who dwells within it. And whoever swears by heaven swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others, you blind guides, who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish so that the outside may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
For you build temples to the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourself that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of the righteous of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Berechiah whom you murdered between the temple and the altar truly I say to you all of these things will come upon this generation Jerusalem Jerusalem who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. You were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you that from now on, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Would you pray with me one more time, brothers and sisters? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus, you are the blessed one. You are our hope. You are our peace. You are our righteousness. You are the reason for the season. You are what makes Christmas merry. Happy birthday, Jesus. Oh, what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are because of the giving of your Son, Thank you, Father. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for removing the scales from our eyes. Thank you for giving us eyes to see and ears to hear your voice, the voice of the Good Shepherd, that we have responded to the truth. Help us, God, now as we recall to mind all the things which you have spoken to us, that we might continue to learn, continue to grow, continue to repent, continue to experience your unconditional love and grace, that we might grow and be used for your glory and for our greatest good. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, we're going to look back at all the messages we have uh, un uncovered and discovered in Matthew chapter 23. So, so strap in. You strapped in? Yeah. All right, good. And don't worry. We're going to go fast, but don't worry. Just drink it in. And if you uh, take notes, don't worry. I've prepared some of my notes for you in the back on your way out. So listen and be, remember, uh, be, be reminded of all the things that, that God has spoken to us through his word by his spirit. Just remember the purpose now that Matthew, the author of this biography of the life of Jesus, why did he even sit down? What was motivating him to write? He sat down with this purpose and this intention in mind. He sat down to write to show to a particularly Jewish audience that Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee is indeed the Messiah, the, the Savior of the Jewish people, the King of the Jews, but not only the King of the Jews, but the King of the world. He is the one predicted in the Jewish scriptures that would come in the name of the Lord. And in chapter 23, what we find in the unfolding of Jesus' life, his 33 years on this earth, it all comes to this vocal point right here. After he has done his ministry, he has called people to repentance. He has preached in the name of his Father. He has pronounced the messages which God has put in his mind to declare to God's people. It is at this point that he has presented himself officially in Jerusalem, the headquarters. It is at this time that he has presented himself to the representatives representatives of the Jewish faith. It is at this time that he is confronted with their unwillingness to believe. And it is in chapter 23 that Jesus formally rejects Israel's corrupt leaders. And now he transitions away from Israel being the people of God to anyone who would follow the Messiah. Brothers and sisters, this has been an in-your-face abrasive chapter in the Bible. It's one that doesn't get a lot of play because it is very, very tough. 
but these are the words of our Lord, the one who is truth. In chapter 23, Jesus warns the people against the hypocritical leaders, and then he pronounces seven woes, seven curses on the representatives of the nation of Israel, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the clergy, the religious establishment. Let's be reminded, in the first 12 verses of this chapter, Jesus warned the people about the hypocrisy of the religious leaders, and it was there that Jesus condemned the Pharisees to uh, their—he condemned them, but he spoke to his disciples. He spoke to the people about the leaders, and he warned them against the false teachings, against the legalism, and against the vain pursuit of glory that was motivating these false teachers and these leaders. And we talked about— in, in our uh, study there, we talked about two types of leaders. There's two types of leaders, those who lead by example and those who lead by trying to control people. One is honoring to God and one is not. Jesus didn't try to control anyone. He spoke the truth without compromise. And then he allowed those individuals to respond to truth, either appropriately or inappropriately, with appropriate consequences. And we said this in light of this because these leaders were motivated by a desire to be esteemed above everyone else, right? We said in that message that leaders are to be honored, but never, not idolized, never idolized. Leaders are sinful men who will fail you, brothers and sisters, but Jesus is the unfailing God wrapped in human flesh. Men will fail you. Human leaders will fail you. But Jesus never fails. The issue is ultimately not with leaders and what leaders do. Brothers and sisters, please take note of this because leaders fail. But it is not an issue of what leaders do. It is an issue of what God has spoken in his word. And a lot of us encounter people, and even ourselves, we struggle with the idea sometimes that, hey, these people call themselves Christians, but they do this and they do that. But brothers and sisters, we should expect that because they are human and they're prone to failures, which is why we should never idolize them, which is why we should never put them on a pedestal, and which is why, brothers and sisters, we should not blame God for what people do in disobedience to Him. Don't blame God for what people do in disobedience to him. And and don't accept a misrepresentation of God by those who are failing to represent him accurately. What was motivating, what what was compelling these leaders? That They had a hunger for significance. They wanted a value and a purpose. They wanted to be affirmed as as having some sort of, uh, of worth. And so they did all of the things that they did to be seen, to be noticed, to be recognized, and to be praised and esteemed by people. But we said that seeking to secure worth and purpose uh, through temporary means is a futile endeavor and a bad idea. Do not seek to secure your significance, your value, your worth in your own temporal abilities, but in the truth of the gospel and what God has declared about you. For God so loved the world. Therein is your significance. Therein is your worth. Therein is your value. And if God has set his affections on you, then that is unchanging. No matter what you're able to do or become unable to do in your life, your value never changes. Because the love of God is where your value and your significance is found. Amen? We also said this because of what was happening as the religious leaders were seeking to exalt themselves. We said this. We said that no image bearer is superior to another image bearer. Do you know what that means? No human being has more intrinsic natural value than any other human being. Regardless of what you do, what position you hold, what status you hold, the things that that make us different, none of those things determine our value and our worth. We were created in the image of the eternal God, the creator, and therein lies our worth, and none of us are superior or inferior to any other human being. And we asked these questions in light of that teaching there in those first 12 verses. We said, 
how do you view the leaders God has given you? What is your view of those whom God has placed in authority over you? And, and what are the motives of those who are influencing you? Leaders are influencers. And if you are subjecting yourself to leaders, if you are following leaders, where are they leading you? What is their desire for you? What is motivating them? What is compelling them? What is moving them? You should be aware of these things if you are allowing yourself to be influenced by other individuals. And then we ask this question, where are you deriving your significance and purpose? For you, what, what lets you know, what affirms for you that you have a purpose, your life has meaning, and that your life has value and significance? What is it? Is it in the love of the eternal God, or is it in your temporal abilities? We moved on from that passage, and we looked at verses 13 through 15, and there we saw the first two of Jesus' curses, the first two of his woes that he pronounces on the religious leaders. And Jesus goes from speaking about the religious leaders to now speaking directly to them. He speaks to them face to face, confronting them, and he pronounces these curses on them. The first two we find in these verses is the, the woe for false teaching. Jesus curses them because of their false teaching and because of their damning evangelism. They are leading people somewhere, but it is not to salvation. It is not into the kingdom of God. It is further away from the kingdom of God. And that has earned from, for them from Jesus woes and curses that they are teaching lies and leading people away from where God would have them to be in his kingdom, in his grace. And we took note of these things and we, we, we said these things in light of those verses. The love of God is unconditional, but the love of God is not universal. Did you hear that? The love of God is unconditional, but it is not universal. It must be received by faith in order to be applied. It is not universal because if it was, then every single individual would be saved. But they are not because they have refused the mercy of God. They have rejected the grace of God. They have ignored the love of God poured out through the babe in the manger and his blood shed on the cross. The love of God is unconditional, but it is not universal. And we said this as well. God is love, but love is not God. Those are two different things. Our culture would esteem love as God, but love is not God. Love is something that God does perfectly. God is a person and has the capacity to express love as well as other attributes and abilities. And if we minimize God to one attribute and say that God can only do one thing, then we are not representing the God of the Bible. Because the God of the Bible is holy, holy, holy. He is a God of grace and mercy, compassion, patience, but he is also a God of justice. God is good. And that's scary. Because a good God will do right, and he will address sin with justice. Amen? We also talked about this as we, uh, as we uh, went through that passage. Christians can be hypocrites, but being a Christian does not automatically make you a hypocrite. Thank you, Jesus. Right? So what's the difference? Because we get written off when we call ourselves Christ followers. We get written off as hypocrites all the time. So what's the difference? Christians can be hypocrites, but being a Christian doesn't make you a hypocrite. So what's the deciding factor? What's the determining factor? Repentance. Repentance. Christians are not sinless, brothers and sisters. We are striving to sin less in light of receiving the Savior who has paid for our sins. We have a different perspective and a different attitude towards sin. We do not celebrate it. We do not tolerate it, but we lay it down at the foot of the cross and leave it there and walk away from sin. As Jesus told the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more, no more. That's what makes us different. 
So we ask these questions in light of that. Do you have an accurate understanding of the gospel? When you say, hey, I share the gospel with people, do you have an accurate understanding of what the Bible teaches about the gospel? Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus alone. We are saved not by what we do, but by what Jesus has already done. Our job is to believe it, to cling to it, to trust in it, brothers and sisters, that Jesus' death provides our forgiveness. We also ask this in light of our study. Are you actually sharing your faith? As a Christian, are you sharing your faith? Or is it something, it's so good, you want to keep it all to yourself? Because that's not what Jesus would have us to do. Are you sharing your faith? And we ask this question too. Is your evangelism soul damning or life giving? Because Jesus pronounced curses on people who were evangelizing. But their evangelism was wrong. Because it was leading them away from the truth and away from the Savior. Away from the only means which God has provided for forgiveness for any human being. Through faith in Jesus, the Messiah. Are we uh, evangelizing correctly? And let me, let me put some, some flesh on that for you. What that means is this. Are, are you telling people the truth about reality? Or are you relying on some sort of gimmicks and games to get people to say yes to Jesus? The gospel is not an invitation. It is a message to be declared. I, I'm, I'm not inviting anybody to Christ. What I'm doing is declaring the truth of what God has spoken and what God has done through Jesus Christ. This is the message that God so loved the world that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That He dwelt among us, that He lived a perfect life, and that He died on a tree. And anybody who accepts that as God's payment is pardoned from their sins. That is a message. There's no bargaining. There's no, there's, there's no debating. It is a message that has been spoken. God offers forgiveness through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's a message to be declared, brothers and sisters. Are we sharing that? Or are we saying, hey, come to my church. We, got, we just got some really nice new chairs. Come to our church. The carpet smells so good. C come to our building. We have the best coffee in town. All of those things are true. But we're not inviting them to coffee. We're inviting them to nothing. We're calling them to receive Jesus. Where one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Amen? We moved on. In verses 16 through 24, we saw Jesus pronounce two more curses, two more woes. And what were those? He, he brought forth a woe, a curse, because of the, the religious leader's false oath making and their selective law keeping their their selective morality they were lying they were making oaths uh, in an inappropriate manner so as to be able to not keep their word they were intentionally deceitful and deceptive lying to people what did we learn from that as Jesus confronted them? He spent a lot of words addressing this particular problem that was, that was seen and practiced by the religious leaders, their false oath-making. This is the principle that we learn as Jesus addressed that. God desires truth in all of our words. He desires truth in all of our words. So what, as Christians, what ought we to be characterized as? People who say what we mean and mean what we say. We let our yes be yes and our no be no. And we believe this truth that a half truth is a whole lie. And so we speak the truth and accept what comes as a result of speaking the truth. Amen? Not only that, but he addressed the issue of selective law keeping as they were, they were emphasizing doing certain aspects of the law, keeping certain aspects of the law but neglecting, willfully, knowledgeably rejecting and ignoring other parts that God required of them. They were focusing on certain commandments given by God while ignoring other obligations. And brothers and sisters, we have an obligation to be continually 
growing in our understanding and in our application of what God requires for us as Christians. We don't know everything. We won't know everything. We will devote our lives to studying the scriptures to say, God, what is pleasing to you? God, what should we do in light of this situation? What would your word and your spirit lead us to do? We need to be constantly learning. Constantly learning in every area of life because God has spoken about every area of life and we need to search the scriptures to find out what God's perspective is and make God's perspective our perspective. We have an obligation to be continually learning and growing and being informed about what it is that is pleasing to our maker and our sweet, sweet savior. Brothers and sisters, don't you want to please him? I'm not talking about convincing him to let you in heaven. He's already done that. He's taken care of that through Jesus. Rest in that. But let that love well up in you that says, Dad, I want to make you proud. Father, I want to live a life that is not wasted or squandered, but that is making a big deal about who you are. Show me how I do that, Father. Show me how to do that. So we ask these questions in light of those verses there. Are your words your bond? Are your words true and trustworthy? And we ask this question, in what areas of life are you being selectively moral? What areas do you know that God has called you to do something and you're ignoring it? And the more important question is, will you repent today? Will you change your mind about that? If you're doing something God has told you not to do, will you stop? And if you haven't been doing something that God has told you as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, as a God-fearer and a lover of God, he has told you that you should do, will you start doing those things today? That's the question. We also ask this question. Are you committed to being a lifelong learner of truth and growing in your understanding of God's will? I was having a conversation with, uh, with John Vogt Sr., the oldest one. I don't know where he is, Sr., Jr., double junior, uh, whatever, I don't know. But I was having a conversation with him on Friday at the men's gathering, and he was talking to me about how he was interacting with his co-workers in his mission field. He's a missionary. When he goes to work every day, he's a missionary. And as he's dialoguing, there he finds other people that confess Christ. And you know what he asked them? He asked the lady that he works with, he said, so what have you been reading? What, what, what have you been, have you been reading something about Christianity or have you been reading and studying anything in the scriptures? What, what are you learning? What is God teaching you presently? Brothers and sisters, if somebody found out that you were a Christian and asked you that, would you be able to answer? Would you be able to say, yeah, I'm, I'm, man, God has really been hitting me. I've been going through the Psalms. Man, I've been going through Proverbs. You know, I'm diving into 1 Corinthians by myself and I, I'm reading a chapter a day and I have, I have more questions than I do answers. But it's amazing because there I find the Spirit is meeting me and, and, and I'm constantly reminded that, that there's a bigger picture and I need to be participating in God's plan. Are, are you going to be able to say, I'm learning because the Spirit is teaching me because I'm plugged in? Are you going to be able to do that? That should be an expectation for us. Are you committed to lifelong learning? We moved on to verses 25 through 28, and there we saw Jesus pronounce two more woes, and they were sort of of the same flavor as he really peeled back the layers there, and, and we saw the, that he, he confronted their, their inner moral impurity. They did a great job of hiding their impurity. Outwardly, they looked very pure and very righteous, but he peeled that back to expose the fact that they were guilty of extortion and excess self-indulgence. He exposed their corrupt hearts. He looked past their external appropriate appearance. And brothers and sisters, some of us are really good at mastering that. Because we come to church and we smile, and we say, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. And we wear sweaters that say, happy birthday, Jesus, on them. And, and everything is good. So we must have it all together, right? Jesus says, nah, 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 nah. I'm getting past all of that. And I'm looking right at your heart because that is what God is most concerned about. Not your clothes, not your hair, but your heart. And where you stand in relationship to your creator who has poured out his love in God incarnate, Emmanuel. Babe in the manger. 
And there, Jesus highlighted the evil act of them abusing their sacred position as leaders in God's uh, family, taking advantage of the people, the evil act of extorting God's people. It was their greed, it was their lack of gratitude, it was their lack of contentment and their self-indulgence that led them to rob God's people, to use the position that they were given or that they, that they took to lead God's people to God. And it was there that they took those positions and used it to rob God's people, to take advantage of them. And we said these things uh, uh, and by way of practical application in light of what Jesus did there confronting them. We said, no one has it all together, brothers and sisters. No one has it all together. And it's not about looking righteous. It's about sincerely striving and growing in holiness. It's okay when somebody says, God is good for you to say, I know that, but I struggle with that. Or I know that God is good, but man, I'm not. I'm just going through some stuff. There's some things I know God has told me to do that I'm just running from. It's okay to say that and be willing to let a brother and sister encourage you and hold you up and say, yeah, we should, I, I'll help you with that. I'll bear your burden. But let's get that out of your life and let's, let's put some good stuff in there. Let's make our father proud. But let's not waste our life and waste our time with things that won't live past today. Amen? And so uh, we, we also said this, that the church, the family of God, the community of believers is God's gift and an asset to each individual believer. You guys hold me up and I hold you up. It's not a fear thing. None of us got it together. We're all dealing with some sin, all of us. It's just a matter of whether or not we're dealing with the sin that we're dealing with. You get that? So we are, uh, we are here to help each other and to hold each other up. We are all collectively a gift to each individual. And we ask these questions in light of that passage there. We said, is, the gathering made, is this gathering made up of whitewashed individuals with whitewashed smiles? Do we just come and put on a parade and pretend to be followers of Jesus? Or are we actually living it out? You say, yo, there's, there's a lot of darkness in this heart. But I thank God that the light has invaded it, that it's overcoming it. it. There's still a lot of darkness there. There's still a lot of selfishness, still a lot of pride, still, still a lot of laziness, still, still a lot of everything. But, but God is working on me. He is working on me and working it out. And I'm not here to pretend. I'm not here to pretend like, like this is just a nice gathering we come to and everything is in order and then we leave. No, this is the place I bring my mess so that my brothers and sisters can speak words of life and healing and encouragement to me, that I might be sober-minded and move on in a life that is not wasted. So are we pretending or are we being family? You know, like that one uncle who doesn't pretend because he's just reckless and you're just like, man, I wish he wasn't here, right? <laughs> he doesn't pretend. He's a hot mess and so are you. So are you. He, he's just not as polished as you, right? We also ask this, what does it matter if you come to church if you're not being church outside of these walls? Jesus didn't die on the cross for you to wake up and come here at 930. That's not it. He died for you to live a life that will touch eternity. A life that will matter when you're gone because of the legacy you've lived by allowing the Holy Spirit to have his way and you answering his call. What does it matter if you come to church if you're not being church outside of these walls? And the last question we ask is, is this, is this a family that can handle the messiness that will happen and be shown when people take their mask off? You ready for that? Are you ready to, stand some, to, to stare somebody in the face and stare them in the eyes and when they say, this is what I did, this is what I've done, this is what I'm doing, without flinching and saying, I'm not shocked because you're a sinner. I'm definitely not shocked because I'm a sinner. My heart grieves because the Spirit of God grieves. But where sin abounds, grace abounds. And if we are willing to repent and lay it at the cross, He will, he will cast it as far from us. How far? As far as the 
east is from the west. How far is that? It just keeps going. It's infinite. They never meet. Amen? And we looked at the next passage, verses 29 through 36. Jesus uh, there pronounces the last curse, the last woe, and it is due to their guilt of killing the messengers of God. How much do you have to hate the truth to kill people that are speaking it to you? Man, their hearts were very hard. We talked about the concept of prophecy because God sent his prophets to the people, right? Prophecy contains two aspects. We said it was a foretelling and a forthtelling. It is is an alluding of what is to come, but it also has immediate implications. What should we do in light of what God has said will happen in the future? What should we do now in light of what the future holds? And the answer is always repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change your mind. Become sober. Leave that toilet water and drink from the well of living water. Leave that behind. Do not sell yourself short because what God calls you to is for your best. Even though you don't understand that eating your vegetables is somehow good for you, do it in faith. Leave the cake alone and eat the vegetables. (laughs) You see what I'm getting. (laughs) No cake. A couple cookies on Christmas, okay? All right. (laughs) So the prophet, so, so this is the concept of prophecy, and, and we said this concerning the, the state of prophecy in our culture today in America. The problem with a large majority of preachers today is that no one wants to kill them. That's the problem with preachers. It, it was said by someone in our, our, our gathering, uh, they mentioned the verse in, in Matthew where he says, Woe to you when people speak well of you. Because that's what they did to the false prophets. They always spoke highly of the people who said, look, God don't really care. God, yeah, yeah, grace will cover that. No need to repent. God's love, love, love. You know, get comfortable in your sin. Just be comfortable in your sin because God's love is so grand and so big. Those are the false prophets. The true prophets were the ones who came and said, repent. Stop sinning. Embrace the love of God the mercy of God and the grace of God before it's too late. Before you prove that the fruit that you bear in your life shows that you are not a child of God. Repent. Because the good news is that when you repent, God will forgive you. And God will embrace you. And God will set your life on a course that far exceeds what you were going to do with it without Him. Amen? We said this too, our confidence is in Christ alone for salvation. You are not saved by what you do. You are saved by what Jesus has done. But, but if you aren't pursuing holiness, then you aren't following Jesus. If you aren't pursuing holiness, then you are not truly following Jesus. We put it this way, no sanctification, no justification. No purification, no salvation. If you are exactly the same way that you were the day you said you became a Christian so long ago, if you're exactly the same way, you you didn't really become a Christian. You weren't really following Jesus because you cannot encounter the living God and remain the same. It's impossible. You cannot say that the Spirit of God has regenerated your soul, has given you a new heart, and yet you still think like your old man. Not saying you, you won't slip back into that, but if, that's, if nothing has changed, then nothing has changed. Isn't that profound? We talked about the doctrine of hell because Jesus did. Jesus said, how will you escape the sentence of hell, the verdict that God pronounces on you that you will be banished into eternal darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. We talked about that, and we also said this, brothers and sisters, that hell is real, and people will go there because of their own guilt. We all deserve hell. I do, and you do. That's what our lives have earned and accrued for us separation from God because that's what our hearts want our sin nature wants to be God and so we separate ourselves from the one who is God 
And if we die in that state, God will give us what we wanted. An eternity without him, where there is no love, no hope, no compassion, no joy, no peace, no pleasure. For that is the absence of God. We also said this, that our struggle with hell, if we struggle to believe that a God of love could have a place called hell, the reason we struggle with that is because our view of God is too low and our view of man is too high. It's too high. Remember what C.S., uh, or not C.S. Lewis, what uh, Charles Spurgeon said, you cannot slander human nature. It is worse than words can paint. We think too highly of ourselves. When we go into the city and we see the skyscrapers and we say, man, we built these buildings. We must be gods. Like Babylon in Genesis chapter 11, building towers that God goes like this to. Well, we can build skyscrapers, but we cannot create one grain of sand out of nothing. Be sober about who you are. You are a creature. You were created by an infinite, eternal God, and you belong to him, and you owe him everything. And hell is spiritual jail. We all applaud justice in the, in the physical human realm, but somehow we turn our brains off when God executes justice in the spiritual realm. Oh, no, that can't be true. God can't be loving and have hell but I'm celebrating that this murderer just got the death penalty. I'm celebrating that because he got what he deserved. Well, what do we all deserve in relationship to God? Hell. We ask these questions in light of that uh, passage there. What kind of prophet do you prefer? Do you want a false teacher who will tickle your ears, who will entertain you and make you laugh and make you feel so comfortable and make you forget about God? Or do you want a true preacher who will constantly encourage you and remind you that we are not of this world? That this is not our home. We are sojourners and we are traveling through. This body will, will decay. It will age and it will fade away, but the soul inside will answer to God. You want a preacher who's just going to make you feel comfortable or one who's going to constantly remind you of your purpose and of what stands before us. How do you, <laughs> we also ask this question, how do you relate to truth? How do you relate to truth? When you hear it, when it's spoken to you, when it's delivered in your face, how do you relate to truth? Do you embrace it or do you run from it? Now I know for a fact that the answer for all of you who have gathered here this morning is that you embrace it because you keep coming back. Because the goal of this fellowship is that we are constantly presented with truth. The good, the bad, the ugly. The part that makes our hearts want to sing. We got that old school choir in our souls, right? And the ones that make us grieve and say, Father, forgive us. Father, forgive me and help me to be a better man, a better woman, a better child of God. In the last passage there, Jesus laments over the city of Jerusalem. He laments. He, he is filled with deep grief and sorrow in light of the fact that he just pronounced seven curses over the representatives of the people of God whom God so loves. And we said this, that false teaching grieves the heart of God and it deserves eternal punishment because it leads others to hell. Jesus, when he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he was addressing the religious leaders. And he was saying, man, I wanted to save these people, but you stood in my way and you hindered those people who were seeking the truth, wanting to be right with God. You kept them from God's provision. When God's Messiah finally came, you steered them away from him. Woe to you. Woe to you. We said this, that learning through Christ-centered biblical teaching, which is what we do here, that that is a matter of eternal life and death. It matters who you listen to. It matters what's happening when you walk into a building that's called a Christian fellowship. And when a guy gets up on stage and he starts talking, it matters what he's saying. 
or what he's not saying. And what he should be doing is being preoccupied with taking the scriptures and explaining it to the lay people that they might know it, understand it, believe it, repent, and obey. That they might be found by God as a pure and spotless bride. That's what we should be concerned with. That's a matter of life and death. And we said these two, I gave these two warnings in light of the false teaching that went forth and how Jesus responded to it. Do not ignore the truth, but allow the truth about reality to dictate the priorities of your life. What God says is really real should affect your priorities, your list of priorities. What's most important to you should be determined by what God says is real. Don't ignore the truth, but allow it to affect you. And the way to avoid being deceived by false teaching is by having a personal commitment to prayer and studying the Word of God. Do you have that? Or do you say, the teaching is really good, so I, I just eat that all week. Do you do that with your Sunday afternoon meal? You say, that meal was so good that I'm not going to eat again until next Sunday. How foolish, right? You would never do that. You eat three times a day. You feed your body. What do you think your soul needs? Be committed to personal prayer, your personal conversations with our Abba. And be committed to pouring over the scriptures that you might be renewed in your mind, not conformed to the pattern of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. You are being constantly bombarded with lies every day from every direction. And if you do not look to the truth, those lies can look like truth and you will buy into them and you will be led off the path of truth. Amen? We ask these questions in light of that lament that Jesus gave there. If our salvation is based on what we believe, then what is more important than investing time in knowing what you believe? What's more important than that? You tell me one priority that, is, that takes precedence over knowing what you believe. How are you going to lead your family, fathers? How are you going to lead your children, mothers? How are you going to sanctify your wives, husbands? H how are you going to speak truth to a dark and, and, and devilish world if you are not informed of the truth? And we ask this question. Are you grieving and lamenting over the lost souls of those who you know that are not Christians. Did you hear that? Jesus lamented. His heart was filled with sorrow. Prayers of anguish going forth because my neighbor, because my uncle, because my brother, because my sister, because my niece and her husband are raising my goddaughter and they do not have the Holy Spirit. They do not know which way is up and which way is down. My two best friends who I love and would take a bullet for, they know about God, but they do not know Him. Prayers of anguish, lamenting, grief. Are you concerned about that? Or do you just got too many things going on today? You care about what really matters in the end. When everything is stripped away, it's not the physical that will matter. The only thing that will matter is souls. Now, normally what we would do is we would go through a list of questions of reflection in light of our study of Matthew chapter 23. But in lieu of that, because I know sometimes when we hear the same voice all the time, we tend to be able to block it out. So what I want to do is I want to let you hear another voice that is going to encourage you to apply what we have learned here in our study of Matthew chapter 23. And I want you to open your ears and open your eyes to hear the same truths going forth from a different voice. But let me pray for us before we do that. Father, I thank you for your word. Sanctify us, purify us, make us more like Jesus by your truth. Your word is truth. Father, I stand first in line to say that I have not obeyed you perfectly, that I have not done all of the things which you have taught me. I have not 
acted them out and expressed them and lived them out in a manner that is pleasing to you. And I will also be first in line to be covered in the blood, to be forgiven, and to be filled. And then I'll stand first in line to do the very things that you told me to do because I'm forgiven. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.